from Microbe TV. This is Immune, episode number three, recorded on December 12th, 2017. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Hi, welcome everyone back. And from Worcester, Ohio, Stephanie Langle. Hey now, how's everyone's December looking like? (laughs) Mine's a little snowy, but not too bad from what I hear. We have had less snow in Ithaca than, uh, for example, New York City, which is a little crazy. That is crazy. (laughs) Well, we had our first snow on Saturday at three inches or so. And today it's kind of, it's raining today. It has now warmed up. All the snow has melted. It is raining and pretty dreary here in New York City. I kind of welcome the snow. I like the cold. I don't know if it's an uh, you know, a Ohio Midwestern thing, Ohio thing, but I know Vincent, you like hot hot weather. That is not my jam. I do love hot weather. <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I loved snow. I don't know, I'm less tolerant. The problem is all the hot states are not the right politics for me. <laughs> <laughs> that does make it challenging. Like <laughs> Forget Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia even, although Virginia seems to be coming around. What about uh, Alabama? That seems to be an important state today. Oh, my gosh. (laughs) That is such a key state. You know, if a Democrat could win the Senate in Alabama, we would have a good chance of defeating the tax bill. That's true, and I'm sure that that's where the opposition is campaigning against uh, using those exact talking points. It will be interesting. I mean, uh, I don't know. But I, the, I, there's good there's good signs being done in, Al- in Alabama, too. There's good oh, signs yeah, sure. there. Birmingham, for sure. But yeah, you know, these sure. are a little, I heard a statistic today, 15% of the population of Alabama is college educated. Mm-hmm. That's and, it? Uh, yeah, isn't that unbelievable? Wow. And, uh, and those are the core voters for the current administration. Do we know the numbers nationwide? I don't know that. I don't know offhand, no. Mm -hmm. I heard that on Pod Save America, my latest uh, podcast interest. Hmm. Pod Save America is by a couple of former Obama and Clinton speechwriters, and um, they started at the beginning of 2017, and they are probably one of the hottest podcasts out there. They're, you know, kind of a liberal, what's wrong with the current administration thing, and people love them, of course, but um, they're doing really well. They get, listen to this. (laughs) So we're we're proud that we we got over a thousand downloads on the last couple of reviews. Oh no, what did they get? Between one and two million per episode. <laughs> no, that's our way. goal. That's our, <laughs> wow, that's our goal for to, for immune one million. So everyone listening out here, all you need to do is recruit about a thousand or ten thousand <laughs> people each, and we'll be good. Yes. And I will say something about Alabama. I think there is a sentiment probably in scientific communities or just like maybe more liberal based um, groups is to kind of just disregard Alabamans or people who are in Alabama. And I would say the opposite. I mean, I'm for Alabama people because the science needs to get there. And if we say, you know, oh, they're just forget Alabama. I'm not even going to bother with them. Well, those people that need science the most are there. So I, I kind of am doing the science for for those people. That's kind of how I like. You know, people. I'm of the of the persuasion where all people are are good. Humans are an amazing species. We should help each other. And and you know, science discoveries should go to everyone. Everyone should benefit. But you know, there's a culture of hatred throughout the world, and people hate each other, and it's just terrible. It should not be that way. You know, animals are good to each other, except when they eat to each other. But. <laughs> <laughs> So we should follow their lead. All right. Uh, we have two stories for you today. Um, yes. And one of them we'll, we'll spend a little less time on, um, but it has to do with um, the dengue vaccine, which is called Dengvaxia, which some of you may have been reading about in the news. We actually covered it pretty extensively on TWIV, but I thought maybe we have some listeners who don't, don't listen to TWIV, and um, you, should, you should know about this. And so Deng- Dengvaxi is a vaccine uh, produced by Sanofi, um, which is directed against dengue virus, which, of course, is a mosquito-borne flavivirus um, vectored by Aedes aegypti. 
primary infection, rash, fever, joint pain, conjunctivitis. Uh, but if uh, you get reinfected with the different serotypes, and there are four serotypes, you can get very, very serious disease involving mm. hemorrhage and shock, and you can die of that. Um, so that's serious dengue. And so this vaccine is supposed to prevent both primary dengue, uh, which is not often life-threatening, although I think see, you can get serious disease in about 1 in 10,000 infection, primary infections, but it's the secondary infections that are a problem. And we think that, uh, and I think there's some good evidence for this, that the secondary enhanced disease is caused by antibodies. So as the current model goes, you make you get infected with dengue, say, type 1. Uh, you recover, and then sometime later, in a different season when there's other serotypes circulating, you, you get infected with a different serotype. You make a memory response to type 1 dengue. Uh, those antibodies will bind to the other dengue that you were infected with, but it will not block infection. And it will allow them to get into cells that they don't normally infect, like cells with receptors for the FC portion of the antibody. Right. And we can talk a little bit more about antibody-dependent enhancement now, yes, if you'd you like. Can. Sure, go ahead. Sure. I know that I think Cindy w had brought up um, the different types of effector, um, effector responses for antibodies. We know that they're produced by B cells. They can either be in um, a membrane-bound form on B cells, or they're in a secretory form secret uh, secreted from plasma cells. And what we're really talking about here is the secreted portion they serve many functions, one of them being opsonization. And opsonization is essentially where the antibodies are going to flag a pathogen by binding to it, and um, then it can be uptaken by a macrophage and phagocytosed. But what uh, Vincent is referring to is essentially a primary infection. You have the ability to do that amongst other um, immune responses. Maybe there's some T cell um, work there. But essentially, in a secondary infection, that antibody is, I'm assuming, weakly bound to um, dengue. And so it's not able to be flagged. It does not become um, phagocytosed, and then it essentially can bind to the FC receptor, as Vincent mentioned. And it's binding by the constant um, portion of the antibody and uptake and, and then that virus can just keep replicating inside ma uh, monocytes and so it's real it's it's I think was maybe first discovered in dengue virus uh, Scott Halsted in the 60s and I know HIV it's been proven as well now there's some other viruses in vitro it has been shown like Ebola um other types of viruses but I think really proven dengue and HIV seem to be the two viruses what do you think, Cindy? Do you have any thoughts on ADE? I guess the only thing I was going to add is the really interesting aspect about this is that you mentioned the serotypes for dengue virus. And I think it's really important because when there's four serotypes, which you may want to explain what a serotype is a little bit more, but it's just a variant that's slightly different. And so what happens is these antibodies are designed to be exquisitely specific for recognizing a particular pathogen. And when that pathogen varies slightly, they don't do as good of a job. Mm -hmm. But but the interesting thing about this is that um, if you got exposed to, for example, dengue 1, and you made a good, strong response against dengue 1, and they got infected with dengue 2, what it does is it trips up the immune response. And so the immune system sort of thinks it's still seeing dengue 1, and so it generates this memory response. And so it responds rapidly with the same armamentarium that it did against dengue one the first time, but it doesn't work as well against dengue two. And so you, the, the primary immune response of dengue against dengue two is not developed properly. And so you employ this um, not, not as good an immune response, which would be excellent against dengue one, but it, when it's employed against dengue two, it doesn't work that well. And what happens is it, 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 it um, enhances the ability of dengue 2 to infect cells it normally wouldn't. And so instead of acting to protect, it causes worse disease. So the, uh, it, and what's interesting is now, that as you're saying that, it doesn't happen with every virus, right? It doesn't. It doesn't. Right? It's, mm -hmm. I'm it, thinking it of really polio. requires. I'm thinking of polio yeah. where, where I have uh, spent my life thinking about polio and three serotypes, you'd never get this. You know. And I wonder if that's because the serotypes don't differ that much in the epitope. Um, Maybe. But 
you know, I, it yeah. seems to be that antibody dependent enhancement, it really is the change in the epitope that causes whatever the other serotype is to trip up um, the antibody's ability to bind to it. That could be why. I think in one of the links that you have in the show notes, it did say if you get infected with the first serotype and then get the second or the third, it's worse than if you got infected with the second or the third and then subsequently got the first. So there seems to be, yeah. you there's know. A, there's a sequence of events. Yeah, 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 which is interesting. With polio, if you are infected with type 1, um, you can get infected with Types two or three, the antibodies do not cross neutralize, mm -hmm. and I don't know mm -hmm. of I don't know of many human multiple infections like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it may be that there's enough protection that you know, but the vaccine has all three serotypes in it, and that's that's really important because um, I read that that's one of the only ways you can try and get around this problem is to immunize with all of the potential things that you could come in contact yeah. with simultaneously, that was which the is idea, problematic. Right? right. So they've yeah. been able to do that for dengue, but the other virus that's really close to that, that we're going to talk about in a little while is Zika. So it's another flavivirus that's similar. And um, it, they think that dengue and Zika have the same thing. So if you get infected with one, this can induce this antibody-dependent enhancement of the other disease as well. And so being close uh, in evolution or however you want to call it, they can enhance each other. And so if we think about immunizing against flaviviruses, another one is yellow fever virus, right? So if we tried to immunize against all the dengue and Zika and, and yellow fever altogether, what about other ones we haven't seen yet? And so you could mm -hmm. still have this happen to, to new emerging diseases that haven't, we haven't seen yet. Now, yeah. What happened with, with Dengvaxia is that it was licensed after a phase three trial, big trial in many, many thousands of people in, in different sites in Latin America and Asia. And after it was a three-dose regimen, they had control in placebo groups, you know, like 10,000 kids in each group, ages 9 through 16, I think. And a, a year after the phase three trial, they had data which showed that it protected against primary dengue and that they didn't see any enhanced disease. So it was licensed. And it's been uh, licensed in Brazil, Philippines, and Mexico. But, of course, it's been now five years, and they've been collecting data. And now it looks like there is some serious disease. And there's a wonderful article by Scott Halstead in Vaccine, and we'll link to that. And he says there is disease in this in this uh, trial. It's at 1.4%. So it's just you know between 1 and 200 kids, but that's too much. It's in two groups. Serious disease is in... Kids who were never infected. That's correct. Dengue, right, right, right. right. And they then got, got the vaccine. vaccine. And that was like correct. having a primary dengue infection. So then when they went out into the world and got dengue out in the wild, then they got serious disease. And, and it yet, essentially sensitized them yeah, to right. whatever they, yeah, if they saw it in the wild. And I was curious, I mean, did they not, I mean, they knew that antibody-dependent de antibody enhancement was a thing. This is something that people have been publishing on. So when they initially w licensed it, and it had only been a couple years, I'm just surprised. I don't know. I would have thought they would have waited that five years. Ah, uh, well, that's know. a good question. But remember, they had invested almost $2 billion into this vaccine. Mm -hmm, I think yeah. they wanted to start earning some yeah. of that back. And sure, sure. How, and how long would you wait? You know, They figured, all right, a year, we haven't seen it. Here's the thing, though. And I learned this from the Halstead article. You can't depend every year on having a, the same dengue seasons. Mm, Serotypes yeah, differ. Right. Yeah, you know, right. And the, the sequence, as you said previously, of serotype infections can make it different. So they didn't see it that first year. And then later they did. The, well, the, and I mean, in these populations, you're going to have a, a, a large majority. I don't know what, 70, 80 percent that already has seen dengue. So you have that variability. And I'm just, I mean, now they're dealing with a really large PR issue. I Google, you Google Dengvaxia and oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a Duterte, problem. that d dictator on the Philippines, he's all riled up and talking yeah. about how he's going to come after them. And so I, I mean, and I'm also curious, you know, your guys' opinion. I, I mean, I think this move to try to make a vaccine for a disease that pretty much dominates in, in poor populations is a good thing. I mean, we, I like, would to think that more pharmaceutical yeah, companies yeah. would do this, yeah. but you know, is this, um, 
as a ripple effect going to make other companies, if they're even considering doing something like this, Good point. where they wouldn't make their money back maybe anyways. I, I just worry about those effects too. Good point. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I don't, I don't either. Yeah, it is definitely something to worry about. The other population that experienced serious disease were kids who, um, the placebo group, all right, where they didn't get uh, the vaccine. And of course, if those, if some of them had been already infected, then they got went out in the world and got dengue infection and, and got ADE and serious disease as well. So two different groups. Hmm. Now, here's the cool thing or the interesting aspect of this. This vaccine was made by taking the yellow fever virus vaccine, which has been used for many, many years, made a DNA copy of it, and they substituted the glycoprotein from dengue, all four serotypes, into that backbone. So the idea was that's a proven vaccine, right. it's safe, so let's just put dengue uh, glycoprotein into it, and that was licensed and used. And there is some idea now that protection against severe dengue requires a T-cell response, right? A CD8 positive mm -hmm. T-cell response. There's some data to suggest that. And the epitopes that are recognized by those T-cells are non-structural proteins that are not dengue in dengvaxia. They're yellow fever, and that's not good enough, apparently. Mm. Isn't that interesting? That is very interesting. Definitely. Huh. I don't think it's as simple as that, because here's a paper... Uh, in the show notes, antibody-dependent enhancement of severe dengue in humans, a study in Nicaragua, where yes. they showed that the antibody levels determined, right? If you had a good level of antibody, you were protected against serious disease, and right. lower levels were not protective. But I think probably it's a combination of that and, and the T-cell. Yeah, we're going to have to cover that in a little bit more detail, because for those who, who don't know a lot about this, so T-cells and B-cells see very different things. So B-cell antibody, B-cell-produced antibodies see things in their native structure, so it would be a virus in its normal state with all its structural components, the way they're organized, and that would be the normally infectious form of the virus. Whereas T-cells, because of the, the way that they recognize what they recognize, they can see things that are inside the virus, and they, they have to get processed and then presented in a way that activates a T-cell. So they can see fundamentally different things that can complement each other. And for viruses, antibodies can prevent the virus from infecting a cell. And we'll also talk about other ways that neutralization can occur, I think, in the paper that we're going to talk about. But the T-cells, what they do is they, they recognize virally infected cells and try to eliminate them from the body. So there's really these very different mechanisms that T and B cells use during infection. And so having both is great, but most <laughs> vaccines are not able to induce a T-cell response. The ones that are closest able to reduce, induce a response has both T-cells and B-cells as components are usually these attenuated viruses and they have their own, or attenuated pathogens, it can be a bacterium too. Um, they have their own safety issues and things. So the closer you are to a natural infection, the more you are likely to induce all of the types of uh, immunity that are required to protect. And the further away you get from the natural infection, the harder it is to induce those. And the more you'll induce antibodies, but maybe not T-cell responses, and it might not be as protective. And another concept that's, you know, as immunologists, we think about a lot, especially vaccinologists, is um, correlates of protection or yes. correlates of immunity. And what type of response is going to predict an individual's ability to fight the infection or to raise an amnestic or a memory response. You know, I think for vac for vaccines, we, we think about, okay, antibodies is what's important. But I've, as we've discussed, maybe it's the T cell response, maybe it's both, maybe it's CD8 or CD4 T cells. And we don't, I mean, it's, I, it's kind of, there's only a few thing, uh, pathogens that we actually know the correlates of protection. I know in the virus that I work with, that's definitely something we would love to know. If I could draw the blood of a pig and a herd and I can tell uh, the farmer, okay, you know, this animal is going to be able to respond very well. This one is not. Um, and, and it's just without knowing that, you don't really know the target of what you're trying to achieve. I, I think uh, what's interesting is that there is another dengue vaccine in the works. It's being developed at the NIH here in the U.S. And that vaccine has got the wonderful name TV003. <laughs> I should say 
catchy. Double, I should say 003, right? <laughs> 007. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that is old dengue. It's an infectious attenuated vaccine like dengue vaccine, except TV003 is old dengue. What they did was to delete, uh, I think, 20 or 30 bases from the three prime non coding region of the viral RNA, and that attenuates the virus so it doesn't cause disease. They get, And in one trial, they gave it to volunteers, and then they challenged them with uh, a uh, dengue vaccine strain, which didn't cause disease, and all of the volunteers were protected. None of them developed serious disease, and they developed what's called sterilizing immunity. In other mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. when they when they were challenged, that challenged dengue virus never replicated in them. Mm -hmm. So that would probably be what you need to prevent, you know, serious dengue disease. Now, in that one, did they have all four serotypes represented? They did. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's all four. So that's going on in other phase trials, and we'll see what happens with that. That's a number of years off before it would be licensed. But to me, that seems to be the one that should have been developed. But of course, in hindsight, is always twenty twenty, right? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so who knows? But now, what do you do? So uh, Philippines has said no more. <laughs> We're not using this <laughs> vaccine. I don't know what Mexico's decided to do, but I heard that Brazil is just going to immunize kids fifteen years and and over. And the logic there is by the time you're 15, you've probably had at least one infection of dengue, right? Right, right. Now, of course, the alternative would be to do a serology test on everyone before you immunize them, but that's kind of logistically complicated, I guess. Yeah, and I'd imagine expensive. the places, it's expensive, right? Like the places where dengue might be the highest might be areas where they don't have good mosquito control. Maybe it's poor areas and serology tests would not just, you know, wouldn't be feasible, but... Idea. I mean, I guess though, if you ha if you vaccinate fifteen and older, and they see most of those children, it's just hard to c consider the fact that these are kids. I always think back to that. It's like, ugh. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Well, the thing is that there have been some very cool uh, rapid antibody detection tests developed in, in the last five ten years, and most of many of them involved cards, just papers saturated oh, yeah. with reagents, and you could put a drop of blood on it and get a result anywhere almost you know right. you don't have to be in a physician's office so but i guess what the studies show including the the science paper that you mentioned um testing the children in nicaragua it's not just presence of antibodies yeah, but it's right. it's the amount of antibody you have yeah. so you know me measuring a titer so a titer is just the dilution in which you don't detect it anymore so the more you have to dilute something the higher the titer, the more antibody was there to begin with. And so if you have high titers, it's very protective. But if you have low titers, you have this potential hmm. for this enhancement. And so just looking at detection is not is not enough. We, need, we would need to do the serotyping for the titers in order to be able to determine whether those children should should or should not be vaccinated. Mm. Yeah, that would be hard to, to um, have that degree of granularity, right? I think... You could just say yes or no and then make a decision. All right, this person has had dengue. We're not going to vaccinate them. Because I think what you're saying, and probably that's the way to do it, it would be too costly mm -hmm. yeah. you know, to do the, the actual titer. Anyway, it's an interesting problem. Um, it's not a nice one because the way I look at it, it just fuels the anti-vaccine crowd, right? That's mm -hmm. what I'm really worried about. And so at least we're discussing this here and explaining that, you know, this this happens all the time. This is a natural phenomenon. This is not a vaccine specific effect. Right. right. And it's really important to emphasize that. Because but it is, I mean, it is a um it's a public relations problem now because this is all over the news and and people think, oh, vaccines are dangerous. In this case, you know, maybe it is, but it's not any more dangerous than having been infected before and have this potential. And so it's just understanding the disease better. That's why we need to, to study these things, that's why we need the money in science to be able to understand these processes better and predict this before it happens. Mm -hmm. This I should point out that there have not been any cases of severe dengue associated with the vaccine in, in any of these countries. It's just they have based this decision on the on the clinical trial results, and so they have avoided problems, right, by, by acting quickly. So that's good. And... Uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to get around it, I'm sure, because you don't want to not immunize against this disease, right? That's, right. that's kind of not right. a good solution, although seems, that seems to be what they 
want to do in the Philippines, but I suspect that they're going to figure some other thing out. Because it definitely, I think it's also more than just the initial, um, you know, they call it break bone fever and people have problems even after. Um, Maybe I had a friend who she went abroad and she came back and she's had issues ever since then. So it definitely leaves people incapacitated. Mm -hmm. So we had a guest on TWIV, um, Nina Martin, who is a virology PhD student at Hopkins. And she told us her story of getting dengue. She was working as a volunteer somewhere. And she says to this day, she has uh, recurring health issues as a consequence, Mm -hmm. right? So even though we say, you know, primary dengue is usually mild, it can have long lasting effects. Right. Do do we know why that it would have long lasting effects? Is there some sort of mimicry with a self antigen that would cause long lasting autoimmune type of reaction? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know either. Maybe yeah, our listeners you, know. <laughs> yeah, maybe they can write in. Do you, do you know? Does Nina? Do you remember what she said? Her recurring. I mean, did it have to do with her? You know, being sore, her bones or muscles? Don't remember. Oh, but okay. we can. Put the the episode in the show notes so people can listen. It was a very interesting uh, story. You know, she said she was working, and usually she used um, mosquito repellent. But one day she was out for a long time, and she could feel that it had worn off, and she started to get bitten. And Uh, it was after that she she developed, you know, a fever, rash, conjunctivitis, bone aches. She recovered, but she said periodically... Oh, I think one of the things was she gets blurry vision, you know, at wow. just out of nowhere and other th- maybe also bone aches or something. But I, don't, I don't know. But, you know, similar things happen with chikungunya where yep. mm-hmm. you have these many people for the rest of their lives have recurrent arthritis, bone aches. So something's happened there. And so, Cindy, I guess when you see arthritis, you think about some autoreactive process. I do. On, right? I tend yeah. to think that, yeah. Hmm. It could just be damage that was happening during the disease that yeah, has now maybe lowered a threshold for inflammatory sequelae. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Really interesting. Oh, it's just uh, immunology, infectious diseases. It's just fascinating. fascinating. <laughs> That's why we're talking about it. Right. right. And, and the, in- and one interesting thing out of this, this end part of the discussion here is that it's not just infection, right? Yeah, we often yeah. think about the immune system and vaccines and infectious disease and influenza and everything, but it also has a lot of other dimensions to it with autoimmune disease, cancer, um, cardiovascular disease. They're all underlying, uh, components of the immune system. And I know that we'll love to talk to uh, some people maybe in our future, um, allergy, um, cancer. There's a lot of different things that I think we're going to tackle in the next couple of months to bring a non-infectious disease perspective to immunology. For sure. Although mine is always going to be infectious. <laughs> and I'm only one out of the three, so that's good. We'll pull you away from that. Maybe, the- maybe. <laughs> I like, uh, I'm, I think cancer is really interesting. I think uh uh, you know, rheumatoid diseases are fascinating, and I'm I'm looking forward to learning about them as well. Now we have a, a paper which uh, I think is is related in many ways and is really interesting, both from a a technical and a theoretical viewpoint. Mm-hmm. And it was published in Cell. It's called a human bispecific antibody against Zika virus with high therapeutic potential. And this is an article with many many. Authors, it's a big collaboration. First author is Jackie Wang, and the last author is David Corti, and it's from uh, Duke National University of Singapore Medical School, Università della Svizzera Italiana, <laughs> University of California, Berkeley, a company called Humabs Biomed SA in Switzerland. Uh, San Raffaele Scientific Institute, the CNR Institute of Neuroscience in Milan, National Infection Service, which is in the UK, University of Zurich, and uh, the first two authors, let's see, wow, number 11, that's the first two authors, they contributed equally, and then number 12, also, the last two authors. Last two, yeah. Last three. Last Last three. Last three, three. that's right. It's so hard. Oh my gosh. So there are a lot of names on this that I know, and, and you probably no, as well, I know, of course, Eva Harris, 
<laughs> I know Antonio Lanzavecchi, a famous immunologist, yes. right? Yes, mm -hmm. he is. Mm -hmm. And Frederica also, Salusto. Salusto. And so this is cool because, all right, Zika, of course, was in the news uh, in, in past years. It's kind of calmed down now because there are fewer infections. But, of course, people were concerned. This is a, a mosquito-transmitted flavivirus, a flavivirus just like dengue virus, right. which emerged in 2015 uh, and was associated with birth defects uh, in initially Brazil and then many other countries. And so if a pregnant woman is infected, uh, first or second trimester, likely to give birth to a, a child. The, the most well-known defect was microcephaly, uh, a reduced brain size and reduced skull, but there are other congenital defects arising as well. So there's a lot of interest, lots of vaccines being developed. And this paper talks about a different kind of vaccine. So we talk about vaccines, we mostly talk about active vaccines where you give the recipient a modified form of the pathogen, a protein from the pathogen or an attenuated virus or an inactivated virus, you develop your own immune response. But sometimes you need to use what we call passive vaccines where you give the products of the immune response. And that is typically antibodies. Another name for it is passive immunotherapy. And you get it when you're in utero, right? From your mother. Yes. You get your yes. mother's antibodies and when you're born because you can't make your own yet. Now, the famous ones that I know of, rabies, if you get bitten by a rabid animal, you will immediately start to get vaccinated, but you will also get some rabies antibodies injected at the bite site, and that yep. helps to get rid of virus. And those are antibodies made in volunteers. They're humans who are immunized with the vaccine, and then they take serum from them. And you're basically getting a mixture of all their antibodies that are that's in their serum. Um, another one that I know of well, because it played out here at Columbia back in the uh, 70s. Uh, Lassa fever virus emerged in Africa, and uh, a number of nurses who were working there started dying. It turned out this was a new virus that no one had seen before. Uh, and one of the patients, a nurse called Penny Pinio, she was flown here to Columbia University Medical Center. And uh, she eventually recovered, and they stored some of her serum. Few uh, sometime later, I don't know exactly how long. Jordi Casals was a virologist working at Yale, and he got this virus and was working on it and got infected. And it turned out he lived here in the neighborhood of Columbia Medical Center, so he he was admitted to Columbia Presbyterian. They found out he had Lassa fever virus infection, and they gave him some of the nurses' serum, and they saved his life. Hmm. I love that story. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, there's another one where um, Ebola, Ebola, in right? 2014, Ian Crozier was um, infected when he was working um, as a doctor uh, there in Africa, and uh, he they gave him also immunotherapy. That's right. So mm -hmm. now we're moving to instead of giving people whole serum from people who are immunized, of course, with Zika, um, you can't give people. I'm sorry, with Ebola, you can't give people Ebola virus. So we're making monoclonal antibodies. So, mono, let's talk just a bit about what is a monoclonal. Is that sure? That seemed like a good thing. Sure. Cindy, you, you could probably do that better than I could. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> sure, I can take that. So, um, when when we develop antibodies, each one of our B cells makes one and only one way of recognizing. So they make one what we call a specificity. So you can recognize one thing. And so if you take those B cells out of an animal and you clone them and allow each one to make many, many copies of itself, you can have one, one well or one group of B cells that all make the same antibody. So that was how it was originally done. And um, what would happen is they would take these B cells and they would fuse them with a, basically a tumor cell. And so the tumor cell would enable that B cell to live forever because if you keep B cells in culture, they'll just die out of the body. They'll only live for a few days or a week. So they keep these and they fuse them. So they make the two cells go together into one. And so that, um, what's called a myeloma, will then make the antibodies of the specificity you want. So you could take, a, for example, if you immunize a mouse, you could take the mouse's spleen out and isolate all the B cells and fuse them to a whole bunch of different tumor cells, and they'll all be making a different specificity of antibody. 
And then you can sort them into individual wells and figure out which well has the antibody that you want. And so what basically you've done is have one B cell making one specificity of antibody, and then you can isolate that antibody, and that's a monoclonal antibody. Now, things have um, gotten a lot more sophisticated now, and we can actually clone out a sequence, the sequence that the B cell is making, the antibody that it's making, and we can clone that in vitro and then produce that in massive amounts. And so that's important because if you want to start changing the activity or the functionality of the antibody by changing the constant region, or you want to alter the specificity slightly, you can do that just by um, some in vitro molecular technologies. What I think is really cool is that and we have to do a paper on this at some point. You can clone from people, say, who have been infected with influenza, individual mm -hmm. B cells, clone out the antibodies yep. and identify in individual specificities and, and find broadly neutralizing antibodies that way. Right. It's so cool. Yes, you can. Yep. Very cool. <laughs> it's just amazing. So that's the basis of the Ebola monoclonal therapy that you mentioned. I think mm -hmm. the, the preparation called ZMAP was a mixture of three different monoclonal antibodies. Right. They, they had immunized mice with virus-like particles, so they were not infectious, so they could do it you know, in a regular old lab. And then they, as you said, took all these individual uh, antibodies and just found those that reacted with virus. Now, there's one big problem with this. Mm -hmm. And so if you make these antibodies in a mouse, those antibodies look a lot like mouse antibody to a human cell or a human if you inject them in that. And so a human will make an immune response against those mouse antibodies. Right. And that can cause a problem. And so what, what we move to in this ability to clone these specificities and put them into new things is what you can do is you can take the specificity, just that part of the molecule, and clone that into a now entirely human antibody. And so what you've done is you've taken that specificity and put it into the human context. And so now those antibodies, when you inject them in a human, look just like all the other antibodies in that human, and they're not generating an immune response and they're not rejected. So we call that humanizing the monoclonal, right? Yes. That's a term we'll probably use. So just so people know that when we say humanizing, we make it look like a human, except for that combining site. And that's right. important. There, it turns out you can do other things to the antibody to make it lo last longer in the blood when you give it mm -hmm. to people, right? Right. You can modify the... So antibodies look like Y molecules. There are four polypeptide chains. And the bottom of the Y, the stem, uh, you can make changes in that. That's called the FC portion to make it longer live in the blood. And that's therapeutically important because if you give someone antibody, you don't want it to be gone in two weeks. You would like it to last longer. Right. So there are lots of cool things that you can do to make them last uh, even longer. So this paper is about making monoclonals to Zika virus. Uh, and there's one other thing yeah. I think we should mention at this point. And you sort of said it. They look like a Y molecule, these antibodies. And that's important because they have two times that they can bind something. So if you mm. put your arms up in a Y and your legs are the constant region, each one of your hands has the ability to bind something. Now, they bind exactly the same thing, and that's also important for their function, but they can be interchanged. And so that's what they're doing in this paper. We'll come to that, is they can change and make one side have one specificity and one side have a different specificity. So this is the ability to, this, to do this cloning and molecular mumbo jumbo here. So, but it's really cool because it allows you then to bind two different things and that never happens in nature. Now this, people are making monoclonals against Zika because we don't have a vaccine yet. It's going to be a while. And a monoclonal, you can, you can actually make the monoclonal relatively quickly and put it through some clinical trials and get it licensed, and then say if a pregnant woman got infected, you could treat her in theory with the monoclonal and prevent uh, the, the invasion of the virus into the fetus, say. Or if you had a pregnant woman in an endemic area for Zika, you could give her therapy to prevent infection. We call that prophylaxis. Mm -hmm. So there, there are multiple applications. And of course, the longer the antibodies last in your blood, the better off you will be. So many groups are doing this. I, I chose this paper because it's got a really a really cool twist to what they're doing. <laughs> so 
basically what they do here is to use the technology that uh, Cindy mentioned to make monoclonal antibodies against Zika virus. Uh, and then they, they focus on three different ones here. Uh, the main, and they give them numbers. You know, one of them is called 190. Uh, I think another is 195 and the other is 200 something. Um, and they do, one of them, 190 is very interesting because it apparently strongly blocks infection with many different isolates. And we should say there's just one serotype of Zika virus. Mm-hmm. Now, let me just pause and talk a little bit about serotype. It's kind Please of an, do, because for those of us who are immunologists, I don't know if I fully understand It's that. kind of an archaic term. So in the old days, pre-cloning and sequencing, I would say, when you had a virus, let's say you had two virus isolates and you knew they were polioviruses, you could inject either one of them into rabbits or both of them into rabbits, raise antibodies against them, and then you would say, do the antibodies against this one virus, can they block infection with the other one as well? And that's how serotype was defined. And so we, we had 100 different rhinoviruses. We made antibodies against them all and, and saw which ones could neutralize the other. And that's how we would say, oh, there are 100 serotypes of rhinovirus, right? Or three serotypes of poliovirus. There was only one serotype of measles. There are one serotype of mumps virus, et cetera. So it was an antibody neutralization-based definition. Well, along comes sequencing, and now instead of doing a neutralization test, you can just sequence the genome of the virus and look at the structural proteins and say, ah, this is a type 1 polio or a type 2 polio or a type 3. So now we use genotyping as a substitute for serotyping. We can tell uh, whether a given virus is going to react with antibodies to a related one simply by looking at the sequence of its structural proteins. And so, now, do always the serotype and the genetics match, or is there sometimes incongruency in that? Well, the more we sequence, the more isolate, the more genotypes we see. But as far as I know, you know, no one's tested all the genotype serotype correlations. You know, nobody makes antibodies to every virus anymore, so. I think that we're confident that the sequence can tell us uh, where to place the virus. So now we make phylogenetic trees, and you do that with all the Zika isolates, and there's one serotype. And, and I think Michael Diamond has looked actually at neutralization and has concluded that there's one serotype. So we can um, confidently look at the sequence and say, you know, what an antibody is going to do against it. So here we have Zika virus isolates. We've and these these individuals made monoclonal antibodies. They found one called 190 that can neutralize many strains. Um, and they also have introduced a change uh, in the FC region of this uh, monoclonal antibody. I like w- the name of that. La la <laughs> la la. <laughs> la la. <laughs> Isn't there a movie something like that? La la land. La la land. La la. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but I heard it's good. This abolishes binding to. FC gamma receptor and complement. So in terms of uh, antibody-dependent enhancement, that would interfere with that, right? Yeah, it completely blocks it, right. So the, uh, you know, we were worried when Zika emerged whether there'd be antibody-dependent enhancement because it's a flavivirus like dengue virus. So um, there's been some indication, at least in cell culture, that you can get antibody-dependent enhancement. Uh, but uh, so here they just remove the, the the sequence in the in the FC portion that would lead to that, and so if you treat someone with this antibody, you won't have to worry about ADE. And they showed that pretty clearly too. Yeah, the assay for that is interesting. You take a cell, I think it's K five six two, right? Right, non permissive. Uh, which normally you you can't infect with Zika virus, yeah. but if you add an antibody to the virus, it will then get into these cells which have FC receptors. Yep, and it will infect them. And but uh, as far as I understand, in people, no one has really shown ADE in uh, in Zika virus infected people. At least not yet. There have been a couple of small studies. All right, what can you do with this monoclonal antibody? Well, they do a lot of other stuff, which is kind of uh, de rigueur, and it's it's less interesting to me. But um, they can determine exactly where this antibody binds. And let's introduce a term that we'll use over and over. Epitope. Yes. <laughs> so, Cindy, what would you say is an epitope? 
So if we start with an antigen, an antigen is a part of any kind of uh, protein or anything that can be recognized by, in this case, we're talking about an antibody. Now, the, the part that actually interacts with the antibody is called the epitope. So it is the primary sequence or the secondary structure if it's, if it's a folded protein that's directly interacting with the antibody. And it, it's typically short for a linear epitope, right? Yeah, it can be quite short. Like what, eight, 10 amino acids, something like that? For, for a T-cell, we talk about epitope definitely being eight to maybe 11 amino acids. I think it depends um, on the antibody structure and mm-hmm. how big, how, how um, interactive the, the binding is between the antibody and the antigen or the epitope. Okay. Now, just to be clear, antigens are not only proteins, right? That's well, in the case of a B cell, mm-hmm. the anti- antibodies can bind to things that are not proteins. For T cells, primarily for CD4 and CD8 T cells, it's going to be okay. a protein. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay, but here, of course, for Zika virus, we're talking about an epitope on the virus particle, which is a protein. And what it they is do is they say, when you make monoclonals, one of the first things you want to do is say, where is this binding on the virus particle? Right. And back in the old days, uh, when monoclonals were first um, developed, the only way you could really do that was to select viruses that are resistant to neutralization with the monoclonal antibody. Mm. And what you do is you grow the virus in the presence of the monoclonal, and there will be some altered viruses with mutations in their genomes. uh, And all you need is one amino acid change in that epitope, and that that could, in theory, block the antibody from binding. Yep. And then you, you could sequence the virus and say, ah, oh, look, here's, here's we've done 20 different monoclonal antibody-resistant viruses, and they're all within this short area. That must be the epitope. And do, didn't they also map? So by um, uh, competition with different antibodies, so if they knew where one bound, if another one yes. competed for it, then they would know that they That's bound right. yeah. either the same or overlapping sites. Yep, you could do that as well, exactly. And then you could say, oh, that was actually done for polio, and we knew there were three or four you know, major regions against which mouse monoclonal antibodies were directed. And that if you want to know what happens in people, that's a different study, right? Because it's not always the same. Right, yeah. All but right. it's more sophisticated now, right? So now in this paper, they do it. They solve the cryo-EM structure of the virus complexed with the antibody. Okay, so the cryo-EM yeah. structure is the atomic structure, basically. At, you know, uh, here they do it at, at pretty low resolution, 22 angstroms, but you can get a very high resolution structure by cryo-EM, and you can do it really quickly. So you just add high amounts of the antibody to the virus, you put it on an a electron microscope grid, you take some pictures, and you can solve the three-dimensional structure, see exactly where the monoclonal is binding. That's what's amazing here, is that they use that, Technology, whereas ten years ago it was really hard to get a virus structure. Now we want to know where the antibody is binding. Sure, let's solve the structure. Yeah, and it's very tube. it's very easy and clear to see where they bind at the different vertexes on the um, on the complex version of the monoclonal and the Zika virus. The yeah. whole panel is amazing. It's gorgeous. There are a lot of beautiful pictures here. So they've solved the structure of the one ninety antibody complex with the virus particle, and you can see where it's binding. And they do some experiments to talk about how this antibody will prevent infection. Because if you think about it, so the antibody is binding to the exterior of the virus particle, of course. It's binding to the viral glycoprotein. And um, it could it could block attachment of the virus to cells. It could block uh, entry from the endosome. It could block fusion. It could even aggregate the virus before it can even attach to the cell, and that would prevent attachment. So all these mechanisms are known mechanisms of... Uh, antibodies blocking virus infection. And they do some experiments which suggest that aggregation is one, but this is a, what you can do with antibodies that's great. You can remove the two antibody, the two uh, specificity areas up on the two Ys from the FC, um, and that will now, you can separate the two arms, right? The two FABs, we call them, and now they can't cross-link virus particles, so they can't aggregate anymore, but it still neutralizes. So there must be more than one mechanism of neutralization. 
Uh, th now, the, the cool thing here is that if you want to use this uh, antibody for therapeutic purposes, you have first you have to show that it works in an animal. So they use mice that they infect with Zika virus, uh, and they treat them either before or after infection with Zika virus with this monoclonal antibodies. And uh, they, they show that you can get protection. You can actually get protection up to, I think, four days after uh, infection. Uh, but you're always going to get monoclonal escape mutants. And in nice. fact, and they show you... they. Got one in mice infected with uh, Zika and treated with uh, this 190 monoclonal. It's really easy to do. In fact, I don't know of any any monoclonals uh, that neutralize viruses for which you you don't get escape mutants. So that's not good because if you treat people, if an escape mutant arises within a few days, that'll n nullify the treatment with the with the antibody. And they they look at a couple of different antibodies here, and they show with all of them you can get escape from neutralization. So then they said, let's combine two of these <laughs> monoclonals together. And this is the cool part of the paper. This is why, cool. Definitely. Which is why it makes it to immune. <laughs> they say, okay, <laughs> we have monoclonal 190 and 185. They, they appear to recognize different epitopes on the virus particle, which you can tell by selecting monoclonal resistant variants or just looking at the binding site by your structural information. And then they construct what they call a bispecific antibody. I have to give a shout out <laughs> to my postdoc advisor, David Siegel. He listened to our first podcast. I'm not sure about the second one, but he was one of the original people who um, worked on bispecific antibodies. Cool. That's oh, great. That's very cool. Yeah. So basically you have you know, at the tips of the Ys, you have the combining sites for the epitopes. And all they do is put two in, in uh, tandem, right? Yep. And, but you can yep. manipulate the DNA. So you, you have the combining site for 190, you have the combining site for 185. And now you can make an antibody which has two combining sites. And I guess they have a little linker in between to space them out. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, Cindy, yeah. Now for the fit though, so so this bi-specific format they use, they call it FIT IG, which is kind of neat, but it, it stands for, it's the um, antibody fragment in tandem, like we mentioned. And now I looked up, it said that there wasn't a linker necessary, but maybe I missed that in oh, this that paper. Could be. That could maybe be. Maybe they include one. I think that was kind of the benefit of this FIT format. And if you kind of picture, you know, we described a Y antibody. If you just hold up your hand yeah. as you're listening, it's kind of this Y. Just kind of stick another little... Um, a little molecule on the sides of the two Ys, and that's what it's going to look like. And it's going to be able to um, be tetravalent or be able to bind um, those different sites. So it's it's a really neat format, and I like the name too, FIT. So instead of an antibody now binding two of the same epitopes, this can now bind to each of two different epitopes. You know, one on each, because each arm of the Y has two different combining sites. And so these antibodies bind the virus with higher affinity than the individual monoclonals, and they neutralize infectivity. And the cool thing is they neutralize all of the monoclonal-resistant variants that they generated against uh, the three monoclonals that they work with in this paper, 185, 190, and 230. And Vincent, I had a question about that. Maybe you'd be best to answer. They, to be able to determine if this was going to develop an escape mutant, they passaged it nine, I'm sorry, eight times. Yeah. Is that sufficient? I, I just don't know like what would be considered a sufficient amount of passaging. And for those who don't know, when we try to determine if a mutation is going to um, result in an epitope changing, we're going to just passage that virus in the cells. I think it would, you said K562, um, for many different passages, whether that's every two days you passage or whatever the cell type um, requires. But I just didn't know, is eight a lot? Should they have kept going? Well, uh, you could probably argue that you should keep going until you get a variant, right? Because they say with the regular monospecific antibodies, it takes three or four passages to get right. resistance. And they did eight. Right. So it's obviously better. But the sure. question is, can you go 20 or 30 or 40? If I were them, I'd keep doing it, right? 
To yeah, me, it just would be interesting to know because it would, I would imagine it, yes, of course, with binding two different epitopes, it's going to be harder to develop escape mutants for both of those, but right. likely it will happen eventually. And so it would be nice to know, you know, at what point and, you know, some a virus like HIV, which is you know, highly mutates at a high rate. Um, I don't know what necessarily what Zika is if it compares into other viruses, it's if you just have to wait longer. So it was just a point I thought I'd bring up. Well, I think that if you do the math with the uh, antivirals for HIV, you know, it's easy to get resistance to one. Two is harder, but doable. Right. And three is really, really hard. Three, three different drugs. So here, it's like having two drugs, two monoclonal yep. antibodies. So I, I think eventually you would get resistance. The question is whether it's therapeutically relevant, right? Right. Because um, right. Zika infection is is short. It's not like HIV, which goes on for your entire life, right? Sure. So there's a finite length of infection. And so as long as you're okay within that time, whether it's a month or two, whatever, uh, then then I think you'll be all right with this. And I, so obviously they have to continue to look at that, but um, it's improved clearly. And I just think it's so cool. And the question is, Cindy, can you put three specificities in there? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that would be cool, right? And finally, they put FIT1 in mice and it protects them uh, from Zika virus infection, even if you give it three days post-infection. So that's a pretty exciting development for Zika. And um, I think it's... It's they're gonna they say we're gonna go ahead and, and look at rhesus macaques, a non human primate model, and see if it can block fetal infection, right? Because you give it to the pregnant mom and infect her and right. see if it will block a fetal infection. Yes. They also talk about uh, modifying the FC to make it to extend its half life. Uh and finally maybe deliver the antibody via a vector instead of giving people the protein. You could give them a virus vector that makes the antibody. That would be interesting. And I know that for HIV, that's being done. They have cloned a broadly neutralizing monoclonal antibody gene into an adenovirus associ adeno-associated virus vector. And that gives you lifetime expression, or at least long-term expression of the protein. And uh, that's going into clinical trials for HIV. And that would be interesting here as well. Anyway, I thought it was technically cool and also gave us a chance to talk about monoclonals and epitopes. And viruses. F viruses, FC. And <laughs> yeah, I'm, I must admit, I, I really love viruses. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm not going to apologize for picking it, but it is immunology too, right? Oh, <laughs> oh, for sure. And it definitely satisfies me. I think last month we had somebody who wrote in and said she wanted to hear about viruses and immunity. So we got to check that off. And yeah, I enjoyed the paper as well. And it really gives you an insight into how these new technologies, because really it would have been difficult to engineer some, uh, an antibody like this, you know, 20, even maybe 10 years ago. So the technology has definitely got us to a point where we can develop some pretty cool and effective things for, uh, for the things that ail us. I have to mention too that the, Cindy, you mentioned your former postdoc advisor or thesis advisor that developed this technology. Yeah, he was one of the first ones, yeah. So I had a colleague here years ago, Sherry Morrison. She's now at UCLA, but she developed a humanizing technology. Oh, wow. And she has a patent for that, which you can imagine is quite lucrative. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh. Yeah, Dave was at the NIH, and so they don't let you nope, they don't. <laughs> make they don't. money yeah, from they... those things. <laughs> All right, we do have emails again. Thanks, everybody. And uh, let's go through some of those. Cindy, can you take that first one? I sure can. So Anthony writes, mice infected with low virus virulence strains of Toxoplasma gondii lose their innate aversion to cat urine even after extensive parasite clearance. And so he says this paper was covered on TWIP60, and he says to split hairs, the infection in mice does not remove the fear of cats. It removes a hardwired aversion to cat urine. And so this is in response to one of the comments that I made um, last time about um, the immune response changing cat behavior. And I mentioned toxoplasma infection in the brain and how that changes cat behavior. And he is correct. It, it removes the, um, the response, uh, the aversion response of the mouse to the cat urine smell, not specifically fear of cats. Yeah, we have to uh, um, 
be grateful to our listeners who will correct us at every time, yeah. right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I guess I, I should listen to that twip. I don't think I got to that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say, you know, one of the things that's really hard about doing the science communication thing is being willing to get out there and say things that might not be 100% correct and allowing people to correct you and being okay with that. Because that's not so easy for those of us who have trained in science and, yeah, and sure. trained to yeah. be, you know, don't say it until you're 100% sure. You know, a lot of people have noticed that we are very ready to admit when we make a mistake on our, on the older podcasts that we do. And uh, they like that. They say that they didn't think scientists would do that. And it's fun for them to learn that. And I think it's an important thing that we do. We, we make st mistakes and we're, I, at least I do. I admit it, you know, cause I think that's how you make science go forward. Absolutely. Yeah. We had Dixon uh, a couple of twips ago say something. And then later in the episode, I pointed out that it was wrong what he had said. <laughs> Here's what he said. He said, a serine protease cleaves at serines. And I said, no, it has serine at the active site. <laughs> he said, oh, my mistake. I said, do you want me to take it out? And he said, no, you know, you can leave it in. And oh. so a listener wrote in and said, that was so encouraging to me because I'm so afraid to ask questions or say things. And now if Dixon does it. It's good for me, you know, so... Well, oh my so gosh! Make this, people feel good too. Yeah, yeah. And as a grad student, I know that's something we just have to get used to. Of course, we're having candidacy, and we do def thesis defenses. And you really, I think that you know, doing a podcast like this, of course, for any grad student, might be outside their comfort zone. But it's good training, and I, I would encourage any other students to, you know, take that step. That's how you're going to learn. It's going to build you good, you know, thick skin. So, and it's good for science in the end. You take the next one, Sin, um, Steph. Yeah, sure. Steve writes, hi, Vincent, Cindy, and Steph. Thank you all for what is sounding like a well-honed team effort on Immune already, which I'm sure is going to give TWIP a run for its money as my most eagerly awaited podcast from the microbe.tv stable. Not sure what the why is. I'm assuming maybe that was a smiley face. Probably, yeah. Probably. Only once a month for such a many-sided subject seems like it's going to take a long time to build an overall picture of the components and functions of the immune system, though. So I wondered if you could do something to bring together the audio immunity collection with the new immune archive so that listeners can easily go back and pick up some of the subjects already covered, such, a, such as MHC, uh, grafts, T-cells, B-cells, germinal centers, the audio, and he... I think it's audio immunity, but maybe it's audio immunity. I think it's auto audio immunity. Okay. I well, Vincent can talk about how he doesn't like that name either because nobody knows <laughs> what the name. If you have is, to, if you have to think about how to pronounce it, <laughs> it's kind of a problem. <laughs> immunity the, uh, here. I yeah, love, I the, love immune. I have love to tell you. immune. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Steve continues. The audio immunity podcast followed a bit of a random pattern, but it would nevertheless enable picking up more background on the subject between the immune installments. You you do include some of the podcasts in your guest listings, but the earlier episodes are missing, and the order a bit confusing. Even on their autoimmunity's own site, they just list dates for the early ones with no indication of what they cover until the links are opened. However, some are very good. I'm going back through them now, but I think I'll need to go over them many times before the different components begin to sink in and be properly remembered. I think I've had a book on compliment in the to read pile by my bed for about 30 years. <laughs> it would also, <laughs> it would be easier if the initials were explained when first mentioned. That's definitely something I need to work on as well. I, for example, knew that major histocompatibility complex was because I was very impressed by a scientific American article I read on it in the 70s. And I knew that CD meant community of differentiation. Uh, However, I will say I, I give you credit. Cluster of differentiation. Cluster of differentiation. You tried, I guess. I mean, it was from the 70s. So uh, it's anywho, okay. Yeah, that's good memory. Differ <laughs> differentiation. So cluster of differentiation. But I didn't know what the M of IgM was for membrane and had forgotten that the T and TSA was for thymus. These terms are generally talked about by the abbreviations, um, but it's hard to take in if one can't, can't pin them down to a place or function by knowing what the name means. A program giving an overview of the key pieces of the whole immunity jigsaw and how they were discovered will be appreciated. 
Another thing that would be useful, I particularly like your coverage of the current affairs affecting science and all your podcasts, and I would like to be able to share them with friends and people who could help the cause without having to post a link to a long program and expect them not to be put off finding the relevant parts. This week's discussion about the graduate student stipends would be a good one to share widely, for example. The running time points help, but it would be best if, as well as the audio or video of the whole program, clips of the individual topic discussions could be included as well. So that they could be easily referenced and shared. I would also offer to copy and edit the ed- individual pieces for you, but I'm long, long-term sick and could not do it very reliably. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Anyhow, it's great that you've managed to come up with yet another podcast. Um, applause to Vincent. That's a first choice when seeking something intelligent to chill to. <laughs> should we say should have Netflix and chill? Should it be immune and chill? And, <laughs> and all the more so not for not just being jammed with background music and noisy, unrelated adverts, as well with a lot of um, YT presentations by others. Many thanks, Steve in Luton, Bedfordshire, England. Thank you, Steve, for the long uh, note. And I, I kind of just start audio immunity. Yes, they. I would just say go ahead and listen to that podcast. I think it would be difficult to link. I, I mean, I haven't really listened to all of their podcasts to even know what the content was. So I, I think it'd be difficult to link. But surely, I think they would. It would be a good supplement if you listen to that as well. But the good news in response to this is we are yeah. in the works and planning Immune 101. Woo-hoo. So we're 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 gonna cover topics, and we're I don't know what format it's gonna be in quite yet. It might be some videos um, with some nice cartoons to explain topics. Seems like we might start with compliment because everyone seems to really like compliment, um, <laughs> which is weird. <laughs> it's very complicated, <laughs> but um, yeah. So uh, we we have the works in the plan, and we're gonna do that and. And that that will probably help a lot of individuals in Definitely. trying to understand what we're talking about. Definitely. Are you teaching next semester, um, Cindy, or are you teaching now? I, I, I am. So I, I teach now. I'm teaching. We, we, the final exam was yesterday and today for the veterinary students. Um, but in the spring, I teach our advanced immunology course. Mm-hmm. And we're going to basically be going through Janeway's immunobiology in one semester with some extra things sprinkled in on more current topics as well. So it'll be pretty intense, but um, I'll be reviewing, brushing up on all my T and B cells, which are not my forte. So um, I don't teach the entire class, but I teach some of it. And, and But we'll be able to sprinkle that in and see what we can do. I'd like to talk to Vincent more about the format of how we should present mm. that. So, so we'll work on that offline and you guys will be looking for that after the new year. Yeah. All right. Peter writes, greetings, immune team. I am much enjoying the new podcast, a great addition to Microbe TV. My own immune system has not w- has not been well this autumn. I caught influenza before I had my annual flu shot. The oh timing would suggest that I caught the virus on a flight or at an airport mm. and then developed secondary bacterial pneumonia which pl- with pleurisy that required a few days in hospital. Aye. After a couple of months, I'm starting to feel better, but still have a persistent nasal drip, which my doctor has so far failed to find an effective treatment for. Enough about me. Uh, You should go to Tahiti for a month. Maybe that'll get rid of it. (laughs) Not that I've been there. I don't know. I have some immunology questions for the team. If our cells are infected with viruses, are there any intracellular defenses that can eliminate the virus from the cells? Or is it just a matter of triggering apoptosis to try and kill the cell before viral replication? Or if the virus blocks apoptosis pathways, sending cytokine signals to instruct NK cells to come and destroy the infected cell? Yes, yes, and yes. (laughs) Yes. And you will hear about it here. I'm sure we'll do a paper on it. Um, The intracellular defense mechanisms against viruses are really fascinating. Yeah, there's a lot of questions there. I think we could use that for fodder for yeah, future for sure. episodes. Uh, but yes, all around. Yep. And what happens with viruses that become latent? I presume that the immune stops virus replication but is unable to eliminate virus from cells since viruses can break latency. The blocking of viral replication is clearly an active process by the immune system. So we're going to get into that too. Yeah. Um, there's definitely, uh, there. yeah, there are definitely antagonists encoded in these latent viral genomes and of course, some of them go completely silent. They don't make any proteins. So they are silent, invisible to the immune system. But we'll talk about those. On the subject of latent infections, in the UK, the chickenpox vaccine is not on the vaccination schedule. 
But the National Health Service offers a free shingles vaccination, Zostervax, at age 70, which I understand is the same as the chickenpox vaccine, but a higher dose. The higher dose being needed because it is intended for the elderly who have a poor immune response. It seems to me that having a single shot of varicella vaccine at a younger age would act as a booster helping to repopulate the immune system with the appropriate immune memory cells and thus maintain zoster virus in a latent state. Do you think that giving someone, it's not, it doesn't actually maintain it in a latent state, it's just if there's a reactivation, it will take care of that, right? Right. Do you think that giving someone in their mid-50s a single varicella vaccination would boost immunity and have the same effect as Zostervax at 70 in preventing shingles? Maybe this idea is rubbish, but I welcome your opinions on this. All right. Saturday Night Live, what do you have to say? <laughs> well, I just did a, <laughs> I did a simple, I Google searched and the CDC, Zostava, Zostavax, it, it's approved by the FDA for people age 50 and older, but it's not recommended for people ages 50 through 59. Um, I'm assuming that it's because if you were to get a booster at like, let's say age 50, that that immunity will maybe peak in your 50s, but maybe it will wane by the time you get to 60 or 70 when you're more likely to contract the virus because your immune system is waning. Or so reactivate. I or reactivate, sorry, rather. So I think that that's why it's recommended for that age group. But I think Cindy might have an update on that. So I, I think you're right. And remember that this is in the U.S. too. Um, right. But but there's the new vaccine, at least in the U.S., that was just approved recently. And that's Shingrix. Or I think I'm saying that properly. Um, and that one is recommended at 50. And the, the reason why is because that one seems to provide longer lasting protection. So the Zostavax wanes within four to five years or protection wanes a lot, um, whereas the Shig Shingrix vaccine seems to remain protective for a lot longer. So you can immunize earlier and maintain that protection. Yeah, that's quite an interesting one, Shingrix. It's a, I think it's a glycoprotein-based vaccine. And, Don't uh, remember the details. And we, we did cover that on TWIV, and yeah. it's really quite protective. It had really oh, yeah. good, really good it's numbers. Ninety something, yeah, seven percent efficacy. I think it was. It was very high. It's remarkable, yeah. Now, the the one thing that we didn't mention yet is this idea that in the UK the chickenpox vaccine is not on the childhood vaccination schedule. I guess I didn't realize that, mm. and that's, I didn't that's know that interesting either. thing. Yeah. Huh. yeah. Should we uh, stop there? Go on some more emails. It's up to you guys. We're at an hour 15. So well, far. it's funny. My husband, he listened to this and he the first thing he said to me was, hey, you went over an hour. And I said, oh, well, okay. Thanks for being our timekeeper. <laughs> Should we stop? Uh, I mean, sure. And we'll still do our picks. Is that true? Yeah, let's do some picks. Sure. Great. That's a, That's right. Steph, what do you have this week? Okay, so there's been some conversation uh, on TWIV. Uh, Dr. John Udell had discussed about uh, maybe needing to work 80 hours a week to get a faculty position. Now, there's been a lot of conversation around this. And, you know, I'm not really going to give my opinion on that. But I think what's missing is, is maybe advice for people who feel like they could just improve their work efficiency for whatever position they want to get in science. So one thing that I'm reading is it's called uh, Deep Work, and it's by... Oh, Cal, I'm going to pull this up so that I know the la Cal Newport. Now, he basically advocates for having long stretches of time where you are deeply focused in one thing. He feels that people who are creative, which as scientists, he feels as well as we all do, we are creative, we have to come up with experiments and think about what we're going to write. Um, instead of having shorter, very distracted bouts of deep work, and I, this is uh, something that I struggle with, I kind of thought multitasking was the best way to work. I enjoy the feeling of it getting a lot done, but this advocates that that's not the best way. And I just want to warn people, you if, you, if you're if you probably listening to this podcast or on social media, this book will probably offend you because he does not use any social media and advocates for the complete, like, getting off of all social media because he feels it takes away from deep work. Now, I don't agree with that, but this book does have some good, you know, tips and tricks of how to kind of get into that deepness and maybe be more efficient during those hours at work so you can have a life um, outside the lab. So I recommend that. And then I just wanted to give a brief update on the grad tax uh, situation, which I think, you know, many people were interested in. I don't think it was 
The Senate did take that provision out of the GOP bill that got passed, but the House, of course, was the one that proposed it. So I, this week, they're going to, you know, over the next couple of weeks, decide on what's in and what's out. And in the show notes, there was about 31, and I'm pretty sure all Republican, but I don't know exactly, a letter, they, they wrote a letter about how that is going to be so damaging to science and to young people. So there are some people speaking out um, in Congress. And I would say, you know, keep calling your people. But that that's kind of the update. We the GOP tax plan has passed. But it, in result, in terms of this grad student tax, I don't we're not sure yet. Well, remember, it has to be reconciled between the House and Senate. And so they will have to vote at least two more times. Right. So this is a great letter, right, where they recognize yeah. that grad students are important for the future of this country, which is nice yes. to hear. But you should still call your senators mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and representatives, because there's plenty of time to convince them that this this shouldn't be part of the tax bill. Definitely. In, in fact, the, the tax bill shouldn't be passed at all, in my view, because it's going to kill <laughs> us as well who are working. But uh, the student part is ridiculous. Yeah. Cindy, what do you have? So I, speaking of... Um, being distracted on social media a little bit. <laughs> um, the other day, um, someone posted a video, and I, I literally had tears going down my uh, eyes. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm willing to fully well admit that. And many of you have probably seen this. There was a heartbreaking video of a starving polar bear, and this was recorded by a National Geographic uh, video recording team, and it's gone completely viral. I mean, this, this video. If you haven't seen it, you have to watch it. But be prepared. It's it's gut-wrenching. But there's been a really mixed response to this video. And um, some people, you know, they're using this to argue that this is what we can expect with climate change, which I, I think is is very real. Um, but other people were harshly critical of the film crew by saying, you know, why didn't they help? And it, their National Geographic put out a, um, a little note about the video providing more background information about how it was recorded and some responses to some of these criticisms, including why didn't the film crew help this poor bear? And, you know, I mean, it's a wild polar bear that's starving for food and you're two people in the middle of nowhere, not close to a city or town and with no weapons or anything to protect yourself. That would have been ludicrous for them to try and help this bear. But nonetheless, they felt really compelled to, to, to take this video so that people could see this, that what was happening. And so I, I'm, I'm linking to the National Geographic response so that you can see the information that they're providing about this video. But if you haven't seen the video, you should see it. Mm. Nature is pretty tough. It is. That yeah. would it is. Sad. All right, I have a little uh, more uplifting pick. Uh, <laughs> mine is a, is a video which is in a blog called Colossal, which is all about visual and graphic arts. Really an interesting blog. But this is a fellow named Tatsuo Horiuchi. He's a 77-year-old artist. He, he retired from another job. He decided he wanted to paint during his retirement, but he didn't want to buy paint, and he didn't want to buy a drawing program for his computer, so he used Excel, which he had from work, and he figured out how to draw these incredible uh, drawings of you know, forests, mountains, cherry blossoms, fish. It's amazing. And they're gorgeous. It's amazing. <laughs> and then he prints them out. And I, I'm just amazed to use Excel. <laughs> you gotta just, yeah. It's a very short video. And he's a neat old guy. And he said, maybe in 10 years, I'll be able to sell some of these. But <laughs> I'd buy one because they're really pretty. They are know, really pretty. Really, really. really uh, and, and just to use Excel, which I use, and I you know, grit my teeth when I use I it know. <laughs> <laughs> to, to paint it. And they have a video of him painting and stuff. So it's pretty cool. And listeners, if you have pics, you can send them in. Uh, we'd love to hear yours as well. And that's Immune Number 3. You can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash immune. And, of course, your favorite pod player program on your phone or tablet will get it. Just subscribe so you get all the episodes. And send your questions and comments to immune at microbe.tv. And we thank all our supporters uh, for helping us financially. If you want to know about that and contribute, go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. And you can find Cindy on Twitter at Cindy Leifer. Steph Langle is at Ohio State University. Thanks, Steph. Thank you. Steph is at Stephanie Langle at Twitter as well. And I'm Vincent Rackin-Yellow. You can find me at virology.ws. 
Music on Immune is by Steve Neal, stevenealpercussion.com. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. See you next month. 